This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up at the link in the description, you also get access to Nebula, a streaming video service that City Beautiful is a part of. The detached single family home, it's the American dream. Neighborhoods filled with these homes are considered a great place to live and raise kids. Because the single family home is so important to our culture, to our psyche, we've zoned a huge amount of our cities exclusively for single family homes. No retail, no employment allowed. Most of our cities are a sort of zoning monoculture. In this video, I'm gonna make the case that the single family zone, known in most zoning maps as R1, needs to be eliminated. Before I make a case against single family zoning, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page with what zoning is actually. Zoning is when a city is divided up into districts or zones, and the zoning code says what type of uses are allowed in those zones, as well as how the buildings can look and function. If you're familiar with the game SimCity or City Skylines, you already get this. Industrial, commercial, and residential zones of varying intensities, from low density to high density, are common in real life too. Let's look at a real zoning map. Here's a generalized zoning map for the city of Seattle. Their actual zoning code is much more complex with many more zones, but they provide a nice general look at their zoning here. You see a lot of yellow on this map. Yellow is the standard color for residential, and light yellow like this is standard for single family residential. In the city of Seattle, 80% of the land area is zoned single family residential. In many zoning codes, this is called R1 zoning for residential at the lowest density, one. I'm going to be calling it R1 in this video so I don't have to keep saying single family zoning over and over. 80% may seem like a high number, but it's pretty common for US cities to zone the vast majority of their land as R1. That means most of the land area is covered with single family homes. Now I wanna be clear, I'm not attacking single family homes, but I am making a case against zoning most of your city so that all you can build are single family homes. That's terrible for the environment, terrible for segregation, and hold on, what's that clicking? Oh, hey, sorry, I was just trying to leave an angry comment on this video. Stop trying to take away houses that everyone wants, Dave. Eagleton, Dave. Well, you don't have to leave a comment. You're in this video with me. We can just discuss it together. Okay, that sounds good. I can tell you all the reasons that you're wrong and you can fail to convince me that you're right. Sure, we can have a debate. It's actually a pretty useful way to discuss this topic. It's almost like I wrote you into the script. What's that now? Nothing. So why am I so wrong in thinking that single family zoning has to go? Okay, I'll lead with the obvious one. People like to live in single family homes. That's why we've zoned so much land for them. You can't change preferences. First of all, yes, many people love living in a single family home, but tastes and preferences change. Many young people, for example, view a big house and a yard as more of a burden than an asset. One of the problems with R1 zoning is that it's been around for so long and employed so widely that it's constrained our choice and our imaginations. All we know is R1 and in many places it's the only housing choice available. It's like going to a store that only sells Cheerios and buying Cheerios. Can you really call that your preference? Maybe if you're a diehard Cheerios person, but with only one option, it's hard to call it everyone's preference. Furthermore, eliminating R1 zoning is not about changing people's preferences. It's about dropping the requirement that only single family houses can be built in a large part of most US cities. Why not let lots of different types of housing get built and see what people's tastes and preferences are once they're given a choice? What? So you wanna let developers build high rise housing next to single family homes? Are you crazy? What about the shadows and the street parking? Those two things do not belong next to each other. Okay, allowing for housing at different densities does not mean developers are automatically gonna build high rise housing. High rise housing is often built because of the amount of land zoned for multifamily housing is so constrained. Developers build up to maximize that scarce resource. If you look at places that don't have R1 zoning everywhere, say cities in Europe, you don't see forests of residential skyscrapers. You see pleasant looking mid-rise buildings and townhomes. It's gentle density that's so nice looking, Americans pay good money to take a vacation and walk around in it. R1 zoning creates this house high-rise dichotomy and leaves out what planners call missing middle housing, like row houses. In the few places where housing like this has been built, it's been very popular. The demand is there, but R1 constrains their supply. Sure, those neighborhoods are nice to visit, but who would wanna live there? You can't raise kids without nice big backyards. Plenty of families in the United States and all around the world raise children in dense cities. There are 1.1 million students in New York City public schools, many of whom live in townhouses, condos, and apartments. And it's silly to think that city kids turn out any worse than suburban kids. 
New York public school kids have gone on to win Nobel Prizes, Fields Medals, Oscars, Grammys, Olympic Medals, and elections. A yard is not necessary for raising children. And again, I'm not saying we need to do away with the yard, or well, at least that's not what I'm saying in this video. I'm just saying we shouldn't be mandating yards for 80% of a city's land area. Yeah, 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 you bring up New York, but New York is always an outlier. Actually, actually, I'm gonna turn the tables on you for a second. I'm gonna make a case against single family zoning and you can tell me why you think it should stay. Well. Okay, great. One of the big problems with single family zoning is inequality. Now you may think that R1 zoning only came about because people demanded it or they thought it was a good place to raise kids. But R1 zoning turned out to be a pretty useful way for upper income whites to exclude poor and minority households. Institutionalized racial segregation in residential areas was struck down by the Supreme Court in Buchanan versus Warley in 1917. But zoning, which was gaining in popularity at the same time, allowed for segregation by income. Wealthy, typically white families could afford these single-family homes, and the segregation effect was largely the same. R1 zoning basically makes households buy land in huge chunks, often a quarter acre or more at a time. Only middle and upper income families can buy land in that quantity, and this creates affluent neighborhoods. Imagine if you wanted to buy a car, but the only way you could is by buying them three at a time only wealthy families would drive. Opportunity and amenities are unevenly distributed in cities and metro areas. Wealthier neighborhoods are generally safer and have better schools. Building multifamily housing would help these residents access those opportunities and improve their quality of life. But aren't the suburbs more diverse than ever? The idea that the suburbs, you know, where most of the R1 zoning is, is being all white and affluent is an outdated concept. Wow, yeah, that's true, Eagles and Dave. I'm actually proud of you. That's some top quality planning knowledge you just dropped. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's the thing. Single family homes in the suburbs are primarily owner occupied. And yes, minority households are buying homes in the suburbs at increased rates, but white households are still overrepresented. And neighborhoods within suburbs are still segregated by income and race. Okay, now that we've covered inequality, let's move on to the environment. R1 zoning requires houses to be separated from other houses on lots. R1 zoning often mandates large setbacks and lot sizes, which means homes are spaced far apart. This reduces overall density and increases the length everyone has to travel to get anywhere. We still rely primarily on internal combustion engine cars to get around, and longer trips mean more emissions. Larger lots also mean that new R1 areas require more space than denser housing types like duplexes and row houses. This means neighborhoods take up more land and potentially transform more natural areas and animal habitats into lawns and driveways. So what will happen if we get rid of single family zoning in cities? Probably not a lot right away, but we'll likely see a greater variety of housing types as developers respond to a less regulated market. We may see more townhouses, which is a great housing type that's compact, good looking, and often even has a small yard for the kids out back. Fun fact, 35% of households with kids in Philadelphia live in row houses. You may see more accessory dwelling units or small granny flats and backyards. You may see large houses that are just too big get separated into duplexes and fourplexes, just like many of the large old houses a few generations ago. All of these outcomes increase housing choice and housing supply and will likely increase housing affordability while not making a big difference in the overall character of many R1 neighborhoods. Well, it doesn't matter if it sounds good or not. R1 zoning is sacred. Nobody's just gonna let it go away. There are places in the United States moving towards eliminating single family zoning. What? Where? Minneapolis adopted a land use plan that sets three units as a residential minimum, no more single family home mandate. California recently passed a law that allows homeowners to easily build up to two accessory dwelling units on their properties, effectively ending single family zoning in the entire state. This doesn't mean there are no more R1 zones on our maps though. Cities still have not upzoned or unzoned their R1 in any sort of meaningful way. But as planners and communities begin to realize the cost of single family zoning, the tide may yet turn. That's it? That's how you're gonna end the video? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good wrap up. It ends on a hopeful note. You're not even gonna mention the streaming service you're part of, the one with Kurtzkasat, CGP Grey, Wendover Productions, Real Life Lore, Polymatter, Real Engineering, Lindsay Ellis, and other fantastic, thoughtful creators? The one that only costs like $3 per month and you get Curiosity Stream bundled with it? Well, I was, but you're doing a pretty good job of it yourself. So do you wanna keep going? Let me show you how this is done. Okay, the service I'm talking about is called Nebula. There's something called Nebula Originals, videos that are only available on this fantastic and very affordable platform. There's Planning Ancient Rome, Dave's tour of the growth of the city of Rome. 
And now there's a new Working Titles video where Dave discusses the intro sequence to one of his favorite shows, Parks and Recreation. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, Eagleton Dave. I'll take it home. For the insanely low annual subscription price of $19.99 or $2.99 per month, you get access to Nebula, which includes my Planning Ancient Rome and Parks and Rec videos. To make this deal even better, Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream offers a vast library of high-quality documentary films by the likes of Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. So to recap, for $3, you can check out my new videos, support City Beautiful and dozens of thoughtful creators, and access a huge library of professional documentary content. To get access, visit curiositystream.com slash citybeautiful. There's a link down in the description. Thank you.